Thank you very much, Lee. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about you and how you can be brilliant every single day. So big ask. I spent the last 15 years working with some of the best CEOs and executives around the world. And one of my observations is some of them are absolutely fantastic, but the problem is they can't be fantastic every single day. Which reminds me of a story. I was sat on the couch at home watching the TV about five years ago. Um, and not that I'm a golfer, but I was watching uh, the British Open. And uh, a very a good golfer called Sergio Garcia was playing. And he'd been brilliant all week, uh, dominating the field. Uh, and it came to the last round. Uh, and he was sort of uh, fantastic. And on the Sunday morning in the front nine, uh, he scored 39 shots. And the previous day, on the Saturday, uh, he'd scored 29 shots on exactly the same holes. So overnight, he'd lost 10 shots on the same hole. Uh, so what happened was Porrick Harrington came past him and won the British Open and the, uh, the, uh, the claret jug. Um, and very interestingly, uh, exactly a year later, uh, Porrick Harrington uh, beat Sergio Garcia. Uh, I think it was in the US Masters. Sergio played brilliantly all week. He got to the Sunday and something went wrong. He was leading the field by six shots. And on the Sunday, again, Porrick Harrington came past him. So that was sort of really interesting to me. Uh, and Peter Alice, the, the famous golf commentator, is watching this and says, it's a funny old game, golf. <laughs> as though it's a complete mystery why these things happen, uh, as though there's a complete loss of form. Um, so I'm there shouting at the television. It's no mystery to me. Uh, actually, I know why that happened, uh, and I know uh, why Sergio Garcia, basically between 2007 and 2008, really didn't learn that much, because he made exactly the same mistake in 2008 as he'd made in 2007. So I'm going to share with you uh, the secret about that, um, uh, some of the things that we've been teaching executives, uh, bringing in some neuroscience, which is my background, uh, and uh, going to reveal some secrets as to how your system works so we're going to go through that, and then I'm going to break with Ted Tradition at the end of the talk, and we're going to have a bit of a live demonstration of something. Um, but I want to just give you the sort of model that we work to uh, that starts to explain why Sergio or anybody uh, may lose performance, or why you may lose performance, and what you need to do to maintain your brilliance every single day. So if we're all after the same goal, uh, we're after improving our performance in some way, or the results in some way, and it doesn't really matter what kind of results we're talking about, whether we're talking about sporting results, whether we're talking about business results, uh, you know, academic performance, uh, relationship performance, sexual performance. I don't know why I'm looking at Simon when I, when I say that, but uh, <laughs> whatever we're talking about, so thank you. Uh, what is going to improve our performance? Well, first and foremost, in order to change the result, you've got to focus on people's behavior. So we've got to do things differently in order to get a different result. So most performance appraisals in industry uh, focus on what you've been doing. So you go in and you see your boss, uh, and he said, oh, I've got some 360 data. You know, you've been doing these kind of things. That's really good. These other things, not so good. So a bit less of that, please, and a bit more of that. So I want you to do that and less of that. Uh, and sometimes that actually works, and then you get a different result. But an awful lot of times, it doesn't make much difference. Or it will only make a difference if the leader stood over that employee cracking the whip and making sure they do this. So uh, it's necessary but insufficient. Uh, and the reason being is that even when people know what to do, sometimes they just don't do it. I know I ought to make another 1,000 calls to 1,000 customers, but do you know what? It's Friday afternoon. Mm, I'm not going to do that. So it's not enough just to focus on what you can see on the surface, on the behaviors. You've got to really get to grips with what's on the inside of individuals. Why do people do what they do? Uh, if you really want to change performance permanently and be brilliant every single day, you've got to get to grips with the inside. So first and foremost, what's actually driving behavior? It's how people think. So how you think determines what you do. So when I'm coaching a, a CEO, if he thinks I'm an idiot, he's not going to do what I say. Why would he? Or if he thinks what I'm saying is rubbish, he won't do it. So I've got to get a grip uh, of what he thinks about. In fact, that requires me to ask him some questions, which is a, a lot more complicated than just observing the behavior. But our view is if you don't get to grips and start to ask some more detailed questions, you won't get a sustainable change in the results. It won't last. You'll get this variance in performance, this form loss. 
So you've got to get to grips with how people think about you, about what you're saying, about the world. But even if you did, it's not enough. Because there's something more fundamental driving how people think. So how you think is really hugely influenced by how you feel. In fact, these two things affect each other. Thinking affects feeling and feeling affects thinking. It goes back and forward in a loop. But the dominant factor really is feeling. So for a whole bunch of neuroscientific reasons we haven't got time to explain, actually, if you want to change what people do, you've got to change their thinking. If you want to change their thinking, you actually have to change how they feel. This is a much more significant impact on that than the other way around. So if you feel anxious, for example, it's no good me saying to you, don't worry. Right? You'll have experienced that doesn't work. Oh, I'm doing this exam. Don't worry. Oh, do you know what? I haven't thought not to worry. That's the answer then. <laughs> I'll not worry. Oh, good. That, how much was that? There's the check. It doesn't work like that. You've all experienced that if you feel anxious, you feel anxious. And no matter, don't worry, is going to help you. In fact, it often makes you worse. All right, you'd say, don't worry. I'm worried. So the real active ingredient is you've got to change this. Still not enough. There's something more fundamental driving how you feel, and that is your raw emotion. So you've got to change the emotion in order to change the feeling, in order to change the thinking. Now, you may be sat there wondering, well, hang on a minute, feelings and emotions are the same stuff, isn't it? It is not. Right? So many people don't realize, and particularly many of my own friends in science and medicine, don't realize that feelings and emotions are not the same thing. In fact, many people don't even realize feelings and thinking are not the same thing, particularly men. Right? <laughs> so you ask many men uh, to tell you how they feel, and they tell you how they think because they don't understand the question. Right? So you can see most of the women in the room nodding, going, that's true, that's true, that's been my experience. And most of the men sat there going, what? What's he talking about? <laughs> These are not the same phenomena. Thinking and feeling are not the same thing, and feelings and emotions are not the same thing. So if you want to change the result by changing the behavior, there are multiple levels, and even if you've got to grips with the emotion, still not enough. There is something even more fundamental down here in the basement of the human system is your physiology. So the reason you get variants like Sergio did in his performance is there are multiple levels that Sergio Garcia hasn't got control over. He's just con concentrating on his technical putting performance or the way that he drives the ball. And he hasn't got a grip of any of this other stuff. And even if he's telling himself and rehearsing mentally, oh, I'm a good golfer, I'm a good golfer, I'm a good golfer, it's not enough because there's still three levels that he hasn't got a grip of. So if you want to be brilliant every single day, you've got to grip, get a grip of every single level. And that's how you crank out your A-game every single day. So let's just work from the back to the top. So if we start with physiology, what is that? That is just simply streams of data. That's all physiology is. It's data streams. So as I'm talking to you right now, most of you are getting streams of data coming into your brain about what's going on in your body. So some of you had the cupcake at the break, and you'll be getting a signal from your gut saying, oh, sugar, we got sugar. And it's coming into your brain, telling your brain what's going on in your gut. Right? Some of you are then getting contractions around that cupcake. So you've got pressure waves being created, telling your brain about what's going on in your gut. So these are all just bits of physiology. So they're just data streams. As some of you might write or type, you've got joint position sense going up the nerve channels into your brain, telling your brain about where your fingers are. They're just bits of physiology. So it's just streams of data, if you will. So what's an emotion? Well, an emotion, if you take all the streams of data, whether it's coming from your gut or your joints, or your heart, or your lungs, if you take the data from all the streams, uh, all the bodily systems, and it comes into your brain is electrical signals, electromagnetic signals, chemical waves, pressure waves, take all of those signals from all of those systems, that's what an emotion is. It's simply energy, E, in motion. That's all an emotion is. So we all have that, even us fellas. We've all got emotions. Every second of every day, there is an energetic state going through us because we're constantly digesting, we're constantly breathing in and out, our heart's constantly beating. It's happening all the time. So we've got energy in motion every single second of every single day, but we may not all have feelings. Feelings are the awareness in our mind of that energy, and that's where the problem is. The energy may be there, but we just don't feel it. So, for example, if you take a very common experience of most people, if we look at what is the uh, energetic signature, if you will, of something like anxiety. So, what goes on physiologically when we're in a state of anxiety? If we look at the heart rate, it's fast. 
The heart's going boom, 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 boom. What else is happening? What's happening in the mouth? The mouth's dry, so you're talking as though you've got cotton wool and you can't get the... That's happening. What's happening in the palms of your hand? They're sweaty. What's happening in the gut? It's churning. These are the specific physiological constituents of that thing that you would know as anxiety. And then I ask you, how do you feel? And you say, all right. So all that data's there, you're just not feeling it. And if you're not feeling it, it's altering what you're thinking and how well you're thinking it, which is changing what you're doing. But you don't realize that, because you feel all right. You're not noticing any of that. You're just thinking what you're thinking and doing what you're doing. So what we're saying is that the brilliance every day requires on you to tune in to what's happening down here at the physiological and the emotional level, and not only become aware of that, but get control over it. Because most of you do not have the control at that level. In fact, very few people have got control of any of this stuff on the inside. And you know, even when people have been highly trained on regulating their behavior, even they haven't got that much control over this. So that's the source of your brilliance. If you can get control over the whole thing, you can crank out your A-game every single day. So how do you get control? Well, we've first of all got to start with which bit of the physiology. Given that so many different signals, where are we going to start? Well, we're going to start with one specific signal, which is the electrical signal of your heart. So your heart beats. So when your heart beats, ping, 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 ping. If you watch you know, the medical programs, before it goes beep, which it always does, doesn't it? Uh, so the ping is, the heart basically contracts and causes a spike of electricity. And you can measure the distance between each heartbeat. And I don't know whether you know, but the distance between each heartbeat varies <coughs> over time. So if we look at your heart rate over time, we'll see that your heart rate will vary up and down. Like that. And if you go to the doctors, he takes your pulse rate and he says the average is 70. But in taking the average, he's ignoring all the variance, and it's the variance that really matters. Taking the average, you lose all the critical data. That's like listening to Mozart and saying, the average is da. Was that Mozart or was it Pearl Jam? Okay, we don't know. So it's the variance, or something that's called heart rate variability, that's key. Heart rate variability key for three reasons. Number one, it predicts your death. So if I measure your variability for 24 hours, I can tell you when you're going to die. So now I have your attention. <laughs> All right. So we tell, tell this to organizations, do you know what? They don't care. So we can't sell them on that. So the other reason is it predicts, if we measure HRV for 24 hours, it can tell you how much energy you've got, uh, which is sort of interesting to leaders because leaders need lots of energy. But the real reason that they buy and they're interested in this is because HRV alters brain function. So when I put you under pressure, what basically happens to your HRV is it becomes super chaotic. So basically, your brain receives a signal from your heart up the nerve channels, which when under pressure becomes super chaos. The consequence of the super chaos is it shuts off your frontal lobes and you have a DIY lobotomy. So under pressure, you lobotomize yourself. It's as though you've suddenly taken the stupid pills and you go oh, like that. So I thought we'd just show that to you for a live demonstration to show you how easy it is to create chaos in your biology, whether you want it to happen or not. So we need a, uh, a willing volunteer for this moment. So just come and sit in the chair, and I'm going to show you how to be brilliant uh, uh, by showing you your physiology. So we need a volunteer just to come up, if you would. And all we're going to do is just put a little clip on your earlobe. So thank you very much. Give him a round of applause by way of encouragement. Thank you. What's your name? Neil Nelson. So Neil is very kind. He doesn't know idea what we're going to be do to him, so this is really very brave. Um, so first of all, we're going to make sure Neil is alive. So is his heart beating? So you can see that every time his heart contracts, it squirts blood up into his ears and his ears go red. And between contractions, all the blood drains out and his ears go white. So if you look at the person sitting next to you, you can actually see their ears flashing red, white, red, white. Actually, you can't see that because your eyes aren't sensitive enough. But what this little clip on Neil's ear can see is we can see the change in color his red, his white, his red, his white, his red, his white. So this is a heartbeat. So he's good news now. You're alive, mate. Uh, the heart's beating away. Boom, 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 boom. So the heart's beating. And so what the software does measures the distance between each one of those beats. And based on the distance between this beat and this beat, it calculates its heart rate. It says it's 76. And it calculates it again and again and again and again and again. And you can see that his heart rate's bobbling along about 75 beats per minute. 
So pretty relaxed. Sat in a chair, your heart rate should be doing about 75 beats per minute. OK, so what we're going to do in a moment is we're going to put him under a little bit of pressure and see how well he copes with that kind of pressure. Are you good under pressure, Neil? Oh, we don't know. Right, we're, just about to, we're just about to find that out, aren't we? So let's see how well he does under pressure. Uh, so uh, we haven't started yet, and already his heart rate's kind of creeping up to about 90. So he said, well, what are we going to do here? Um, so uh, we're going to give you some mathematics. How good are you at mathematics? Quite good. Oh, he's quite good. So this will be no trouble, right? So can't, oh, look, he thinks he's quite good, but his heart rate's now... <laughs> I'm good. I'm quite good. He's gone off the charts, and now he's, <laughs> he's settling back down. And you can see there's a lot of chaos going through his system right now. So even though he, I'm good at this, that is a natural physiological response to a challenge. You put somebody under pressure, the physiologist, whether he wants it to happen or not. You see, he might look like he's in control. He is not. <laughs> in fact, I am the puppet master. Right? <laughs> I'm pulling his strings whether he wants me to do that or not. So at the moment, there's a bit of uncertainty. The physiology is sort of settled around about 80, slightly higher than it was before, because he doesn't know what's going to happen. So let's see how well his brain actually functions under pressure. So let's see how good at that math he really was. So what you need to do is you're going to count out loud backwards, subtracting threes. I'm going to start you off at a certain number. I want you to take away three, then give me the answer. Take away three again, give me the answer. Take away another three, give me the answer. And keep going, serial subtractions of threes without making a mistake. And if you make a mistake, it's 50 quid. Okay, so financial penalty for every error. Okay, so uh, is, is that all right with you? Okay, so uh, no, no problem at all. We're going to count out loud backwards, subtracting threes. Uh, the mention of 50 quid, look, the heart rate's crept up here to 120, just the tension in the system. So again, I'm just talking to him. That's all that's happening. And actually, by me just talking to him, a physiology chaos is kicking in, and that's going to be sending a signal from his heart to his brain that's going to be inhibiting his brain function. We'll see that. So as fast as you can, without making a mistake, some serial subtraction of three, starting off at 300. Go, come on. 300. 200 Ten. Seven, come on, faster. 286. 275. 284. 273. 286. 286. What? Well done. Give him a round of applause, everybody. So what you can see is, when I started to feed him the wrong answers, uh, 208, uh, what? what? You get this, it's called cortical inhibition, or frontal lobe shutdown. So under pressure, the frontal lobe shuts down, and the simplest of tasks subtract three from that number. Uh, uh, what? Can't do it. That is happening to all of you when you're under pressure. Right? Your brain is built this way. So one of the things you need to learn to do is to get control of that physiological level and switch from a chaotic signal to what's called coherence. So the thing that, under, that underpins brain function is the ability to generate a coherent signal. So there's variance, but it's stable variance as opposed to wildly fluctuant variance. And that is the source of your brilliance. So thank you very much. <laughs>